Hello and welcome to another interview here in the Wannabe Entrepreneur podcast, the podcast about what's really like to bootstrap a company. And today we are going to speak with an expert in bootstrapping and uh, building in public. His name is Arvid Kohl, which I just learned that is also German, even though he's uh, living at the moment in Toronto. Welcome, Arvid. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's, it's surprising how many Germans you find <laughs> in, in entrepreneurship <laughs> or people who have been to Germany. But yeah, thanks so much for having me uh, on the show today. I'm really, really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. And uh, I just, yeah, I also want to say that you can find Germans actually everywhere. Like, it's funny <laughs> because every time I'm, I'm traveling now and uh, anywhere, you can be like in the Amazonia or like, you know, really remote places. There's always one German there, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's just, um, yeah, I, I, our current entrepreneurship culture or just culture in general makes people mm -hmm. want to just travel, experience the world before they settle down or something. And it, it's, it's just so easy to get around. And honestly, for me, as an entrepreneur, I mean, <laughs> I'm in Canada now, right? I moved three uh, months ago. But when we actually had our business, Feedback Panda, my, my partner, Danielle, my, mm -hmm. my girlfriend and I, when we had our SaaS business, we were operating it both from Berlin most of the year. And then over Christmas, we would come here to Canada where her family is. She's Canadian. Ah, and right. we would spend a good month in Canada and we would operate our business from here. And it would be no difference because it's a digital business. Everything yeah, is on, on the computer anyway. So we would just run the business from anywhere. We could have went to, I don't know, like Southeast Asia and run our business from there. Especially if you are a digital entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Completely. I, I totally agree. And it, it, it's also interesting that now that you speak about Germans' mentality of traveling around and, and uh, kind of visiting the world before set, settling down, because that's something that is we don't have it here in, in Portugal. So in Portugal, what, what you're taught is that you should do everything right away. So you do high school, you do college, you get a job. And the faster you know, possible, you know, the faster, the, the better for, for you. Mm -hmm. But it's quite common in Germany to have a gap year. And a lot of yeah. people that I've met actually spend that gap year in uh, South America visiting, uh, you know, I don't know, Mexico or Argentina or something like that. W why is that? Why, why is this... Uh, this uh the mentality <laughs> well i think there um I, i honestly i can't really tell you because i personally i didn't take a gap year i went to the military which is funny enough like german military it's mm -hmm. like a volunteer you can, you can go there you can do your nine months of service or oh you don't have to anymore it used to be a, a right. mandatory but it hasn't been but i went there anyway in the, in the early 2000s and i had my own gap year which was just like experiencing the military which was its own little interesting experience, can tell you that. But um, then I went right to university, um, but I didn't really take university too, too seriously. I think I spent more time playing World of Warcraft at that point <laughs> than, I, than I went to university. But that itself was my little gap year because I was exploring <laughs> Azeroth, the, the fictional content, uh, continent of Azeroth with my, <laughs> the other players. And, and in doing so, I, um, funny enough, I, I had connections to people all over the world. I learned how to speak English fluently because school mm -hmm. English just doesn't really apply, right? It's, it's a, it's right. a you, you don't really know how to, how to speak this language if you just go to school and, and uh, go to class, but you have to immerse yourself. And I did that through my, yeah, World of Warcraft, essentially. I also was um, in, a, in a raid guild, which is in, in World of Warcraft terms just means you hang out multiple evenings a week and you you fight big dragons together mm -hmm. for hours and end. try to organize 40 people to get to one uh, kill the dragon together yeah. and i was organizing this so i was like uh organizing these these raids in the, in the guild so all of a sudden i had managerial experience experience yes. because i needed yeah, to yeah. Uh, to get these people together and get them to perform optimally as a team so my gap year was virtual i it was full of exactly. dragons you, and you, other you're already things. in the metaverse Right. <laughs> in, the, in the metaverse <laughs> yeah before it was a term so yes. um but i i think um historically this comes from um the what the germans call wanderjahre which is like yeah the, the years of wandering around mm -hmm. which i think in the middle ages or just yeah the enlightenment time was when when young men 
were just going around um, trying to find uh, a profession, a skill, mm. a trade, and they would wander around Germany trying to find masters in a craft, like carpenters or sh yeah, cobblers, shoemakers, like all these kind of things, and learn from them for a couple months, and then wander around to another master in another town, stay with them, work for them for free, essentially for right. for, for lodging and, and kind food. of internships. It, yeah. It's internships that people were just like roaming around the country and learning as much as they could. I think that's a that's traditional so German yeah. thing or a, a middle oh. European thing, central European thing. You find that in Poland and mm -hmm. the Czech Republic and Austria too. Um, yeah, that, that's a thing that people did. And I think now we just do it in a digital way or in a, in a global way, either way. And um, both of them are, are very important. And I, I, I find uh, it's something you should definitely do yeah. if you can afford it. Um, yeah. Because it will just open up your perspective on life. Yeah, and I think that's also, I think you just touched on a very key point, which is if you can afford it. And I think what I, what I've uh, experienced in Germany is that uh, there's a lot of money and people. It, it's very easy also to get jobs. So yeah. there's actually no problem to just taking a gap year. And here in Portugal, people they really need money and they they want to. They cannot afford uh, some yeah. some of the times to to take a yeah, gap but, year, but but Arvid, it's uh, we we started to talk and I I didn't <laughs> properly introduce yourself. I guess a lot of people already know you, but uh, you, as I said, like you you are a, a true entrepreneur. You had your uh, own company called uh, uh, Feedback Panda, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, you wrote already a couple of uh, in very interesting books, uh, the Embedded Entrepreneur. Zero to Sold, and now you are writing a book about uh, actually a building public book. So you are you're mm -hmm. writing a book with uh, your audience, and this is something I, I want to talk with you about. But uh, before, I would I would like for you to just, uh, in your own words, introduce yourself and say a little bit more about uh, who is Arvid. Okay. Well, the, yeah, I. Uh... I always try to avoid categories because it would be easy to say I used to be a software engineer, then mm -hmm. I turned into an entrepreneur plus software engineer, and then I turned into a writer plus entrepreneur plus software engineer. I kind of <laughs> yeah, it's kind of stacking things, right? Yeah. But honestly, I'm I'm just uh, what I found out over all these years is that I'm a person that really likes to help other people help themselves, and everything that I do is kind of aimed at that. I want to show people what I'm doing so they can do these same things successfully or do their thing, whatever it is successfully. Mm -hmm. And um, whatever skills I have at the time, either software engineering or um, building businesses or now writing and, and telling stories, that is what I use to do it. Right. That's kind of, that's what I think I am. That's what I'm at my core is trying, mm -hmm. uh, is trying to get people to where they want to be by lifting them up a little bit by helping yeah. them along their way. They still have to do the work themselves. I'm not going to do it for them, but I'm going to yeah. try to help them as much as I can to, to find their path forward. And that's kind of, that's why I write. That's why I record a podcast every week. That's why I have a newsletter that shares what I'm writing every week. That's why I'm engaging with people on Twitter. I think 27 hours every day kind of feels like <laughs> it. And that's, that's why I'm, I'm talking to you right now because I, I kind of, I, I try, I, I get derived so much energy from sharing what I'm doing mm -hmm. and how I'm doing it and seeing other people either get this little moment of joy by just hearing somebody very <laughs> energetic talk about a thing yeah. that, that I personally like or listening to this and, and getting one tiny little new thing out of it and applying it to their business or their journey, their creator's journey or whatever. And then, you know, that's, that's why I do this. And that's, that's who I am. Uh, every right. single day I want to have these kind of moments because they just mm -hmm. they propel me forward. And, that, and, that's, and it's, that's it's funny because say. you you told me before uh, before we started recording that you are an introvert, but <laughs> when you yeah. start talking about entrepreneurship and helping people and bootstrapping, you kind of become an extrovert and you actually get energy from that, yeah. right? Which is kind of the opposite of being an introvert. So, yeah. do you think that you are becoming an extrovert, which is also possible, or why do you think th this is? <laughs> well, I, I think it's a continuum. I learned that I, I, I used to be. Um, where do I start this story? So when mm -hmm. I first joined um, a company called Coding in, in in Silicon Valley, it was my first job. I got it on Twitter, funny enough. That's a story I can also share if you're interested in it. But in, yeah, of course. in 20, 2012, uh, I was pretty active as a software engineer on GitHub. I, I built a couple of projects just to see 
um, if I can build it. Back then, CoffeeScript was all the rage, which was like JavaScript, uh, a version of JavaScript, mm -hmm. kind of um, that compiled to JavaScript. That was super interesting. People really liked that, and it was new. And MongoDB was the big new database, and I just built a little project. So somebody reached out to me on Twitter in 2012 saying, hey, I've seen your project on GitHub. We use the same technology in our business. Do you want to join us? Do you need a job? Um, I was living in, in Dresden, Germany at the time. And um, I was saying, yeah, cool. San Francisco, that sounds interesting. So I uh, they invited me over there. I, I hung out with them, uh, spent a couple of weeks just like looking into what they did and all of that. And then I went back to Dresden and I had a, had a cool job there with with the silicon valley venture funded company out of the i wasn't even studying uh computer science at that point i was studying f uh, philosophy and political science yeah. like it, it was it was pretty strange but that's how i got my first job and um at that time they were so big into personality profiles into the meyer brick Briggs test, right? This kind of INTP, mm -hmm. ENTP thing. And back then, I, I think I scored a, an INTP, so an introverted, uh, I don't even know what the other things are. Yeah. What is it like? Per perceptive and all the kind of stuff. So the I is important. I was, I was right. scoring pretty heavily on the introvert scale. And over time, I noticed that I, whenever I did the test again, I moved way more into the middle. I was extroverted in some ways and I was introverted in others. And what I really, what I really understood was that my passion for whatever I was talking about heavily impacted on if I derived energy from it or if I spent energy talking about mm. it. If you ask me to talk about certain things that I'm not interested in or that I'm not as interested in as I may be in entrepreneurship and audience building and building a public, you will see that I quickly tire of that conversation. So what happens when you go to a party, let's say, and you start speaking with people that do not care too much about entrepreneurship and they just bring a whatever sports or, or uh, like, do you feel that then you, you get tired of the conversation quicker? Like, are you more shy? How do yeah, you absolutely. I mean, yeah. I may not be shy because I've, I've learned how to communicate with mm -hmm. people in a way that makes them interested in what I have to say, but mm -hmm. I will just retreat from those conversations. Like if people talk about something and I guess nobody goes to parties anymore, <laughs> at least not yeah, over, yeah, over the cool. last couple of years. And I guess if there was a party now, people would be talking about vaccination nonstop and yeah, that would be true. kind of boring, but it's very boring. Um, if, if I, I, re, I recall uh, being at like family functions and all that stuff, if people talk about something that I'm not interested in, I mm -hmm. just either I find somebody that I can talk to about the things that I'm interested in or yeah. I retreat from the conversation. It's really yeah. what I do. And you know, in that it, regard, I'm introverted. I, yeah, yeah. I, and it's funny, I, I can relate a, a lot to what you just say. And sometimes I feel that I'm, I'm talking with, with my friends and I feel like, okay, I'm only talking about entrepreneurship. And then I started wondering if they would get tired of it. Is that something that <laughs> Probably. comes from your mind or not so much? Well, the the, the difference that I've noticed um, in any kind of conversation about any kind of topic is the, the moment you stop talking as a teacher, the moment you stop preaching, and the moment you, you actually show curiosity in somebody else's opinion on whatever subject that is, mm -hmm. the conversation is much more enjoyable. right? If, right. if you talk about entrepreneurship and it, comes, it turns into a lecture, Obviously, people will not enjoy that anymore after a couple minutes. But if you if you contextualize it within the life experience of the other person, mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, this sounds like uh, this this entrepreneurship thing that I've been doing, and and tell me more about what you did in that moment and how it made you feel, or what did you learn that you could then later apply in in your your job or in your hobby or whatever. The moment you turn this into something about them. And not just about you and talking about entrepreneurship and what you learned and how great of an entrepreneur you are, then this becomes a much more pleasant conversation. I yeah. think it's a general rule of thumb that if you show interest in other people, they'll be more interested in you. So, yeah. you, you know, it's it's just really how, how you approach conversations in general. And, and and this is actually a great bridge to speak a little bit about the your book, The embedded entrepreneur how to yeah. build an audience driven business and this is very interesting because the way i started i guess most of my projects so far were i kind of find found a problem something that i got excited about i started with an idea uh, for instance i have a climate change app uh, it's called change mm -hmm. it and I, I started because it was my own problem i I wanted to do something about climate change i didn't know what so i, I built this problem but i, I was not into the the medium, not into the, the the community at all, right? So mm -hmm. I, I built it, 
And then I started the podcast and I realized that there's this, this new, for me at least, it's new idea of uh, audience first approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you want to, I, I would like to, to hear in your own words, what is this? What is uh, the build uh, an audience first approach uh, okay. business? So, uh, yeah, there, there's two ways of building a business, right? One is a product first approach where you mm -hmm. build the thing and then you share it with the world and you hope that people buy it. Right. And um, then there's the audience first approach, which, which is flip side of that, which is you, you build a product with and for an audience that you have found or created before you ever start building the product. You start right. with the people, right? You, you start with the community, you embed yourself in the community, you learn about not what what you should build, but what the problems are that people have. You have conversations with people about what are the most pressing, critical problems in your mm -hmm. life and in your business journey, in your entrepreneurial journey, in your hobby journey, whatever. It depends on the community that you're in. And then you, you, you start analyzing these problems for potential solutions. And then you have chats with people about how they currently solve their problems and if they, if they spend money on it or not, if they have a budget or if they would never pay for anything like that. And then if you have validated that, you go to the next step and you actually start building it and you have prototypes and you share that with your community and you get people to test them before you ever share them with the community at large. Like it's a, it's a person, a people driven approach. The product right. first approach is a build driven approach where you as a builder, either a software engineer or a no coder or a, a, a marketer or a writer, whatever you pr create the product first. And then you try to stuff it into a market by doing a lot of marketing, a lot of sales, which is a valid approach for many, many things out there. Mm -hmm. But the audience driven approach, the audience first approach, whatever you want to call it is um, a more validated way that is more conducive to things like bootstrapping, like self-funding exactly. a business mm -hmm. and um, a community driven approach in a sense that if you are part of a community of people that is already engaging and talking about problems and solutions about the issues and challenges that they're facing, then building a business, building a product out of there is much easier because you have validation baked into every single step along the way. The, the, the visual, visualization um, to this that makes it very, very clear is that if you know the website Product Hunt, where, yeah. where people launch products every single day, you will always see a couple of products that are listed every single day on the top that have a lot of engagement. They have right. a lot of upvotes that have a lot of people liking them, a lot of people voting for them, having questions and cheering for the person that launched right. it. The and ones the I always envy when I look at them. I was like, how yes. come they are there and I'm here in, yeah. the, in the bottom? <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. Why are these people so successful with their product that is no better than the product than, that is like on in rank 50 or 57 or 100, right? A lot of people launch products every day yeah, yeah, and yeah, only yeah. five of them make it to the top, obviously. And then there's the, the big rest, the long tail on the bottom. And most of these products on the bottom are equally good products. Like from, from the skill of the, the people building them, from how they solve a problem, they, they are good. They're good products. It's just that they don't have this amplification audience that when they are launched. And the, the thing is that most people don't understand about Product Hunt. Product Hunt is not a reflection of how good your product is. Product mm -hmm. Hunt is how good is your existing your audience? How, yeah. how many people are already there to support mm -hmm. you? And only that will get you up upvoted yeah. in Product yeah. Hunt. Uh, it's very interesting that you say that because actually in today's episode of the podcast that I, I just shared, I, I speak about Product Hunt and I speak exactly about that. And that's something... That applies not only to product hunt, but to most social media, which is most yeah. of social media's algorithm is the number of engagement your post has in the least amount of time, right? Yeah. And I, th I think that's how most al algorithms work. And it's the same with product hunt. So when you share on product hunt the idea, you are first in the newest, um, for I think 24 hours, you are in the newest uh, products frame, mm -hmm. and then you can be bumped to the featured product, right? Based yeah. on your performance. No. And that's something that I've never thought about before. And I have to be honest, I, I, I love entrepreneurship and I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and no one ever mentioned this. So no one ever, I guess most of them follow the product driven approach and uh, it makes total sense. The moment you have an audience, you are able to trick uh, quote unquote the algorithm so yeah. that you get a lot of engagement quickly and the algorithm will say, okay, this is a great product. So it's probably let's uh, bump it to the to the feature a uh, featured product or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and I don't think it's even tricking the algorithm. I mean, that's why the algorithm is the way it is because it wants to see um, are enough people 
already convinced that this is a good post. And mm -hmm. if you have built an audience of people who think that whatever you say is good, well, then it is good, right? And because mm -hmm. if it wasn't, you is would it? not have the audience. Right, but uh, I mean, you can have an audience, let's say you are um, whatever, a pop star or something, and yeah. people just follow you, uh, you know, blindly, oh, oh, yeah. but it doesn't okay, mean I the product is good. Sorry, I, I mean, I mean, uh, let's let's just look at the definition of the word "good." It doesn't mean of of a, um, a like an objectively good quality. It is good to create more engagement on the social media that you're using it on, right? The ah, algorithm yes. looks for mm -hmm. stuff that is good for Twitter. Like Twitter exactly. wants to yeah. amplify stuff where more people click on Twitter, more people look at Twitter, more people scroll on your profile and then follow you and build relationships. So it's um, it validates for the Twitter algorithm that this is good Twitter content, mm -hmm. and that that's that's yeah, kind of what okay, I mean. I agree, like obviously, yes. quality of the, the the post itself and quality of the product that is something yeah. outside of the scope of the algorithm of Twitter. But most of the time it's also correlated because you have to think about the fact that people don't follow and engage with everybody. They follow and engage with a limited amount of people because as, as humans, we only have this limited capacity yeah. of building relationships, right? The Dunbar number is, is like for personal relationships. And there probably is a digital version of how many people can I actively engage with on Twitter mm -hmm. um, that I care about. And the people who, you choose to follow on Twitter and you choose to retweet and interact with, that's a limited number. It may be a couple dozens and maybe a couple hundred, but for every person out there, that is a limited number. So m the more people you get to follow you and retweet you and um, like you, the more your content apparently is something helpful, meaningful, in instructive, insightful, mm -hmm. entertaining, whatever it is. So th there is a measure of good quality for whatever reason, insightful quality, entertainment quality, can be anything that a large amount of active and engaged followers expresses to the world. Mm -hmm. So I would say there is a certain amount of this is good in a highly engaged tweet. It could right. be this is good at shitposting or this is yeah. good at being sarcastic. But, you know, there is a certain kind of quality that every highly engaged tweet reaches. Yeah. So, so do you think it's a, a fair measure of uh, of how good the the product is somehow in in a um in a non complete way yes and in, in a probability based scenario yeah, yeah, like yeah. if if you like particularly with founders that have a, a a larger audience um you could expect that if they if they release a new product for example you see this in the in the indie hacker space quite a bit like people have a thing going on and then they build another project and then they launch it and then their existing audience amplifies the project well why did this project come to happen the founder didn't just have a random idea and then they built it. It is quite mm -hmm. likely that if they have a large audience, they have been building an audience first and audience centric product because mm -hmm. they have found out that a big share of their audience have a problem that they could solve. And then they engaged with their audience. They told them, well, I'm thinking about building this tool. What needs do you have? And then their audience gave them feedback and they said, well, um, this is my problem. I solve it every two weeks because it's a biweekly report that I need to create. And um, I use these tools for it. And then the, the founder creates something better, shares it with their audience. And they say, okay, this is really good, but it needs this kind of additional feature. And then they built it. And, you know, mm -hmm. like they, they build it in public. They build it with their audience. And then right. they launch it as yeah. a product that exactly solves the problem for yeah. a validated existing audience out there. So, of course, it's going to be better than a random product because it's been validated yeah, all along exactly. the way. Yeah, and you have so a distribution that's... channel too immediately. And yeah, the... they, they, they might have paying customers before they launch it. Exactly. Yeah, and then so let, let's go back to this these two approaches: the uh, audience first approach and then the product first approach. So, sure. would you say that the product first approach is more connected with VC and the typical Silicon Valley way of building companies? I think yes, um, um, because that's just really how software products used to work. Like that you would have to build the thing. Um, and I'm talking about software products mostly, right? Software as a service businesses and platforms mm -hmm. and stuff like that, um, because that's that's where I'm from. I know that there's other kind of content, but even that, like even if you look at info products like books and courses, they used to be written long before they were marketed and uh, right. 
yeah, just disseminate it into the public, right? People um, going through the reg regular publishing industry, if they were writers, they would send uh, a draft of uh, what they wanted to write about. And then the publisher would say, yes, write that book. Then they would write that book. Then the editors would come in. Then there would be revisions. And then at some point, the book would be done. The editor said, yeah, that's great. And now we're going to market it to the community out there. That's the first time people would learn of that book. Right. And the same is for software products. People would they sit in their basements for six months and build a product. I've done that in the past to mm -hmm. horrendous effects. So like it really didn't work out. But with teams of people, we built and built and built, and then we launched it and it fizzled out because nobody needed the product because we hadn't validated that. It was right. horrible. But that was the way that most things were built because that's also how funding used to work. Yeah. People would fund a business plan and then people would build the product that was promised in the business plan once they got the funding. Exactly. Mostly because... Uh, you know, in, in the world of um, building um, physical products, that's how it used to work. You need inventory, you need the machines, you need a factory, whatever. Mm -hmm. And this needs upfront money. So you need to have a business plan upfront and then get people to pay mm -hmm. you that money so you can build it. It's it's just the, the way it used to be. Yeah. And that is where the, the capital, not just venture capital, but all capital used to be allocated in businesses like that and venture capital has been moving this into the software world and has kept the paradigm going where mm -hmm. you put a lot of money into the business they built the product in stealth mode and then they launch it and then marketing happens and then market share is, uh, is assumed that they get every customer in the potential market and then they grow and explode mm -hmm. and the rocket ship and happens it also requires and, yeah. a lot of money right like it requires yeah. a lot of money to to do marketing uh, yeah, most of the money for a lot of companies are spent in marketing, especially in the initial after you having the having the product, and yeah. I felt that this this now I understand this is what was always missing for me as a bootstrapper because again I was I was reading and I was listening to podcasts and a lot of the teachings are the same you know try to do you know a lean approach build an MVP collect ideas from your audience and then build mm -hmm. especially in software of course. But then every time I tried it, it didn't work. It's like, okay, but I don't get customers. So that it would be like, <laughs> I would build something, but then I don't get customers. What's happening? And uh, then I started this, this podcast. Now I have some kind of an audience also for the podcast. And yeah. now I start to understand what is the problem that this audience needs to be solved. And okay. it's funny because for, now, for instance, I'm uh, in... Uh, um, a side of the, the podcast, I have I'm also building a co-working, a virtual co-working space for bootstrappers, mm -hmm. and it's cool. much easier to get feedback for people because I already have the audience, I can speak with them directly. It's much easier to get paying uh, customers too, because again, there's already an audience. But this is something that was uh, at least in this this VC, you know, Y Combinator podcast and so on. I, I feel that they never talked about this, you know. Yeah, and I, I think it's. Um... It, it it should be something that is logical to everybody building a business right like a business is not is, is really by definition a process that allows you to reliably sell the same product over and over again and if you want to sell the same product over and over again it needs to be a product that people want to buy over and over again and it needs mm -hmm. to be a product that people need to use so they can justify paying money and to be able to need to use it, they need to have a, a critical problem and mm -hmm. to be able to have enough people who reliably want to, or who reliably have this problem so they need to buy something to solve it there needs to be enough people out there so it really starts with people and yeah. um i think people have just forgotten that they need to validate this because we've been so focused on um solving our own problems particularly if you're a software engineer like you you build stuff you run into little hiccups and you think oh i need to build a web time web uptime monitoring thing or i need mm -hmm. to build an error tracking thing or i need to build uh, a notification bar or stuff like that stuff that we need ourselves and then we forget that we are in an industry of people who love solving their own problems, you know, like particularly for software engineers, every software engineer out there is trying to build developer tools for other developers because yeah. that's the problem space they know, but they completely forget that they just spent solving their own problem and every software engineer out there loves solving their own problems. Like it's literally the worst space to solve problems in is a space where people love a challenge. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 a bizarre thing, but people built and built, and then nobody uses their problem, mm -hmm. uh, their products, because 
people just don't have the critical problem. They can solve it themselves. So it is imperative that you understand who you are solving problems for, what problems mm -hmm. they actually have that they can solve themselves really well, and then build a solution to that problem. It starts with people right. and it starts with listening, not assuming, but with listening and observing people's, people in their communities talking yeah. about the problems that they cannot solve easily themselves. I, I would also say that it starts with finding this community, right? Yeah. Really. And uh, this is something that I, that I also want to ask you. So let's say that there is a software developer that always wanted to build their own product, right? Yeah. And they want to do the audience-first approach, but right. they have no audience. So how do you start? Like, uh, what, what are the first steps? Yeah, okay. So the, the most important thing, I kind of hinted at it already just now saying this about software engineers. You don't have to solve problems for software engineers. You can solve problems for anybody else out there. It's not just software engineers. Even though you think that might be the perfect audience because you understand them so well because you're mm -hmm. one of them, Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're limited to solving problems for other software engineers. And that's kind of what I talk about in The Embedded Entrepreneur. That's essentially what the book starts with. It's this guide, this step-by-step -step guide to figuring out who else you could be serving beyond the, the, the group of people that comes up first in your mind if you think about who should I help, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're a software engineer, you want to have software engineers. If you're a marketer, you want to help other marketers. If you're a teacher, you want to have other teachers. But it's not the only thing you can do. So what I what I describe in the book, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown here, you and the, the audience right now, yeah, um, is you try to figure out what potential audiences you could be serving. And that's a brainstorming activity. It's kind of think about anybody who out there that is a group of people that have shared problems, shared interests, shared goals that are essentially establishing communities around, around these goals, these interests, these practices, and write them down. And I'm just going to go through this exercise right now for myself because that's the easiest way for me to do it. I'm sitting here in my office um, surrounded by quite a number of computers that I use for my coding, right? I'm a software mm -hmm. engineer, so I'm right down software engineer. Um, I also look at, well, software engineer is quite the generic kind of uh, description for what a lot of different people do as very different activities. So I write down the kind of sub audiences that I have in software engineering. I'm a front-end engineer sometimes. I'm a back-end engineer sometimes. I'm a mobile engineer sometimes. Sometimes right. I build software infrastructure. I'm a DevOps engineer. Sometimes I do database stuff. So I'm a database administrator. I write down front-end engineer, back-end engineer, infrastructure stuff, um, back, uh, what is it, database uh, administrator, whatever. Mm -hmm. So now I have five little things that are just audiences from the thing that I um, know professionally the best. Then I look at what else am I doing here? I'm a writer. So I write down writer. I write down nonfiction author because I write nonfiction books. I don't write stories about people. I write instructional content. But I also write down fiction author because that's something interesting. Came out in my, in my brainstorming session. I noticed that I could also be helping fiction authors, mm -hmm. right? Fiction so authors these are need, things that um, you're already doing. Exactly. I can write down all of these little audiences and that's mm -hmm. what I'm currently doing at this moment. Now, I'm going back through my life and just looking into the other experiences that I had, professional or non-professional, um, I used to work in a printing business. Like I used to work for a print print shop. So I write down um, print businesses. I mm -hmm. used to work for a factory where they they vacuum painted some kind of uh, like what was it like a car utilities or something. I write down my experiences that I had in professional businesses, all of them. I put them in a list, and I. I look into my professional experiences with other people. In running my uh, the business with my partner, we had to talk to tax advisors. We had to talk to lawyers. We had engaged with them. And I, we've seen that they had certain problems in their interaction with us that we could probably have made easier with a tool or two. So I'm writing down tax advisors. I'm writing down lawyers and notaries. Now I look at my partner, Danielle. She was an online English teacher. She's an opera singer. Now I look into her family. We have plumbers, we have nurses, we have construction workers, we have um, mail delivery people. I'm just looking into my own family at this point too. We have people who are working uh, with students. They are, they are studying at a university, uh, people who are working as secretaries in an office. And then I, I look into my friends and family. I have gym owners. I have, you know, I'm just going into like all the people I know and I write down what they do what they do professionally and what they like doing as a hobby. 
But but now but now you have uh, thousands of communities. Yeah. So how do you pick the ones you actually want to work at? That's the next step. I and in, in the book I go through each of these communities and I start ranking them, because mm -hmm. you 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 want to find a community that you really enjoy. You want to find a community that has interesting problems. You want to find a community that pays money to solve their problems. And you want to find a community that is large enough for you to start a business, but mm -hmm. not so large that there's already gigantic businesses with gigantic budgets in there. So that's the four steps that you would go through for each of these communities. And you give them a ranking. Somewhere between zero to five or zero to 10, whatever floats your boat, however granular, granular you want to be, you look at each of these things, you put them in an Excel sheet or in a list somewhere, and you go through what I call affinity. How much do I like this? Right? right. I look at software engineers and I have a scale from zero to five. And I say, okay, I, I do like software engineers, but like I already said, they love solving their own problems. So as a business, they probably score a four or a three on my zero to five kind of scoring there. Right. Then I look at entrepreneurs and I give them a pure five because I love helping people build businesses. I look at writers, pure five. I want to help more writers or more maybe entrepreneurial writers build their own writing habit. And then, and then I look at tax advisors and I give them a one because <laughs> I really am not a fan. I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, they do their job and it's important to have taxes and stuff, but I don't want to spend the next 10 years of my life exactly. working with people who love taxes. It's really yeah. not my thing. And I think and, that's a very good exercise too, right? So to yeah. see if you actually love something or are passionate about something is to do this exercise where you yeah. think about, can I work in this product for the next 10 years? That's, or 15 that's years. one of the most important things to do right from the start, which is why I start with it, right? Yeah. If you see an audience, no matter how much money you could be making building a business for them, yeah. if you hate building a business in a, with, with these people, if you hate having a customer service conversation because you just don't relate with these people, you're not going to have a good time building a business. Yeah. You better build a business for people that you can actually resonate with. And that's the thing. I'm a software engineer. Like, You would think that the people that I resonate with most are software engineers, but they're not. Like I, I resonate much more with writers than I do with software engineers, even though mm. software engineers are writers too. They just write for a computer, right? They, they <laughs> give instruction to yeah. a computer while um, a nonfiction writer give instruction, gives instruction to people. I, I feel that sometimes, let's say you, you studied software engineered, engineering so you are in this cubicle you are in this box you can yeah. only hang out with software engineers you can only work as a software engineer and for me you know some it's really hard for me to think about me as a podcaster because i'm also a software engineer right so i i worked in tech companies and now yeah. I'm, i'm thinking okay but now i'm a podcaster and i feel somehow ashamed sometimes to say to people that now i'm trying to make it as a podcaster which is mm -hmm. very different than a software engineering and yeah. i do, do you, did you feel that in society You know, there's still this kind of embarrassment of getting out of your little box of what yeah. you studied. Yeah, it's 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 also a comfort zone thing, right? Because in, in many ways we are taught that specialization is everything. Like you you go to school, you you specialize in one particular thing, you go to you college, you go to university, you you get a degree in this one thing, and then you do that for the rest of your life. Yeah. I think this was a pre- um, digital society thinking. Yeah. This was a, a pre-creator economy thinking because we now notice that um, there is no straight path. The, being an adaptive generalist, like a T-shaped person, like having a, a broad range of skills and then being a specialist in one of them, or what I call M-shaped, like you, mm -hmm. you are a generalist and then you are, are um, have a deep knowledge of multiple different uh, disciplines within that. That is the kind of skill set you need for the future, right? You need to be able, yeah. as a podcaster in entrepreneurship, you need to know a lot about entrepreneurship and you need a lot about how to talk to people. These are two things that may have an intersecting kind of uh, area, but usually are quite different. An entrepreneur talks about revenue. They talk about like opportunity, marketing, all that thing. A podcaster is more uh, an empathetic person. They need to be able to draw information from other people in a conversation. That is not necessarily the same. So you need to do both and right. then combine yeah. them into something holistic. I believe that in the creator economy where people also, where the economy itself changes so quickly, you need to be more adaptive and you need to be able to build um, a deep level of skill in multiple disciplines at the same time and then use your intersectional qualities of that those skills to find the niche that works best for you. But uh, I also feel that 
if you don't want to be an entrepreneur and if you want to work for someone else, it's more required for you to specialize in one single thing. And that was the my biggest or one of my what I was really scared when I was moving or quitting my job and going towards entrepreneurship. Yeah. Because I thought, okay, now I will stop being, you know, a specialized software developer. And if this doesn't work out, and I want to return to a company. I want to work again in in this in this area. I will uh, I will be losing in comparison with my other with my peers and my colleagues that did not yeah. go through this entrepreneurship because right. people and I, I felt as well because I was working let's say for Trivago and I after like let's say six months I already wanted to implement my own thing. You know, this being an entrepreneur <laughs> is always inside of me. But then they don't want me to do that. Because you're yeah. like, no, Tiago, we want you to code this feature. That's that's why we pay you. And, uh, you know, so I feel that there is this kind of thing. In one hand, if you want to kind of, let's say, follow the traditional path, then uh, you need to focus in one area. Yeah. And if you want to become an entrepreneur, you, you need to kind of spread out through multiple yes. fields. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think um, if you want to become an entrepreneur, it's, it's important that, that you say it that way because not every person is... Um, will be happy being an entrepreneur, right? We we all can try it. We all can go for it and see if it works for us. But if spending 10, 12 hour days building a business that you're not sure if it will survive or not and the stress levels and the anxiety mm -hmm. that comes with that, mm -hmm. if that is too much for you, if you would rather have um, a, a nine to five where you know um, work is done when I leave work, that yeah. is also fine. The, to me, it's a question of upside and downside, right? If you if you take a, a regular employment, you have capped downside because you know um, you will be protected by the law. You will have a contract, and the contract states that if you spend so and so much time every week working for these people, they have to pay you, and they can fire you if the work you do is okay, right? You protect it, and mm -hmm. your upside is also capped. Like you won't be making much more than your salary, and maybe some bonus. That's, right. that's really, and, and that's also in the contract, so you know what to expect. Then when you look at entrepreneurship, your upside is unlimited. You can build a business that you completely own. You can grow it over time. It Maybe in the beginning, it makes no money at all. Uh, half a year later, it makes a couple thousand bucks a month. It sustains itself. Then a year later, it sustains you because it makes $10,000 a month. Right. So after expenses, you can pay yourself a couple thousand bucks and you can pay your mortgage and your food and all that stuff. Yeah. Two years later, it makes uh, 20, 30,000. Yeah. 10 years later, it makes a million bucks a year. You sell the business and you're set for life. Unlimited yeah. upside. But of course, downside is also unlimited. You could lose everything. You could lose all the money that you put into the business if you don't, um, if you run it without having a company around it and you um, you lose somebody's data and they sue you for millions of dollars, now you're personally liable, right? If you don't set it up in a way that it's a limited liability situation. So at, with unlimited upside comes unlimited downside. Mm -hmm. And most people are not happy to work in a, in a kind of way that has unlimited downside. Right. Like you have to have a certain kind of risk appetite for risk to, to a, be able to sustain that um, yeah, throughout your journey. Now with a bootstrap business, usually you have, um, you, you don't take on a massive amount of debt. You don't build systems that are super critical. You, you're building an iteration of something out there that is just a little bit better for a more specific audience. It's usually not that risky and you can right. run it as a side project while you do your job and all that kind of stuff. We can get, mm -hmm. a, get to that in, in, in a second. But what I personally feel is that, um, emp being employed has a certain downside beyond what you think your downside is. And that is that you can just be let go and you have no ownership whatsoever exactly. to cr yeah. create income for you while you're looking for a new job, right? Mm -hmm. As an entrepreneur, you could just um, do some freelancing on the side, or you could have an info product out there like a book or a course that is uh, sharing your learnings from the journey that can make you some money on the side even though it's not your main business. The moment you diversify your income sources and you look for passive income, mm -hmm. which is a scale, right? There's a scale between active income and mass a passive, <laughs> massive income. I would love that. <laughs> passive income. And you start out on the far active side by selling your time for money. And then ideally being entrepreneurial, you move towards having a diversified passive income set somewhere right. out there. And that is that is a, a journey that takes some time, but I, I highly recommend Definitely for people takes, to at least yeah. try it because 
you can always be let go. The pandemic was a big, big problem for many, many people. They noticed that their secure job all of a sudden wasn't so secure anymore. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Arvid, in, in this in this sense, at least maybe we have different experiences. Maybe you are in a more av- advanced uh, stage of your companies. But for me, when I look to, especially working in Germany, the, the salary I was making, the benefits I had, yeah. you know, for instance, yeah. uh, I was working in a startup as well uh, um, in the travel business. Yeah. And when COVID hit, okay, if it was if it was maybe another country or something, there would be no support. And then the German yeah. state gave the, the a lot of support that, that basically made sure that the company yeah. would stay. So uh, yeah. for me, it's, it feels almost impossible for me to be able to generate the salary that I would otherwise generate as a software developer. Because software developers in Germany can generate with 80, 100K a year, yeah. right? So yeah. Like for you, that, that's what I noticed now. For me, as a bootstrapper, to generate a salary of 100k a year, oh boy, yeah, it, it's absurd. It's really yeah. it's a lot, a lot of work, a lot of luck as well. So for me, I really think that doing for the money, of, of course, and you're absolutely right. There's no cap, you know, downside in the down and in the ceiling. There's no ceiling, right? Yeah. But in in reality, there's probably some kind of ceiling because in the probability of someone may, may making 100k a year, um, at least I don't know if you have a different opinion, but for me it seems that it's not that high. And uh, no, no. and for me the idea is it's it's what I love about being an entrepreneur is having the control, uh, being the one that is creating this. This is my company. This is my uh, my share of of good that I'm doing to the world. You know. Um, so the, I don't know. Maybe that we have different opinions there. I uh, I don't think so. I, I mean, obviously, not everybody will succeed, right? That's one of the. That's why entrepreneurship is a risky business, quite literally, because uh, there is no guaranteed outcome. It's the same with like an audience building an audience per- first business. Just because you are looking at your audience and you are detecting their problems and you're trying to build a solution, um, doesn't mean that you will necessarily have a million dollar business. There is so much along the way that needs to happen. You need to, uh, you need to be lucky too, right? Mm-hmm. And at some point, you, you need to um, increase your opportunity surface by trying out multiple things. It's like what, what Daniel Vassallo calls its por- portfolio of small bets. Like you need to make small bets yeah. and see which one of them are more fruitful than the others. And then you need to hone in on them. And then you need to do more bets and see if they are performing better than the ones you already made. Like entrepreneurship is risk. Entrepreneurship has a lot of failure and entrepreneurship is not something that is guaranteed or quick. Like you were talking about a hundred thousand dollars or euros Mm -hmm. in in yearly Mm -hmm. um, income. Yeah. This is not something that will happen overnight. This is something that might take years to get to, and it might not work at all with the one idea that you have, right? If you, if you want to build, and I I don't know what exactly um, just to take as an uh, example here, but if you want to build a software, like an uptime monitoring software Mm -hmm. in a market that already is quite saturated, you might be able to build it to, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars MRR within your little niche of um, indie hackers or something, and then it it won't go higher because the the top market is already uh, captured by the bigger bigger software infrastructure companies out there. So that means it's it's two two hundred thousand dollars a year um, that you might make in, in the best case, you probably mm-hmm. won't even get there. So you, you, the business itself might not even generate a hundred thousand, let alone you could take that as, as dividends or as, as payments for yourself. So absolutely, this is not a guarantee, but right. exactly what you then said is what, what makes a difference, which is ownership of the business. Because let's say you have a business that makes $10,000 a month in recurring revenue at its best, Right, mm-hmm. like you built this tool, you, you can't pay yourself ten thousand bucks over ten thousand revenue because you have expenses. It's probably going to be uh, w- with taxes. You're going to have like five thousand dollars left, and maybe you can pay you that, or you invest it in the business, or whatever. So, but that's mm-hmm. fifty fifty k a year. Let's talk about maybe say that right. So the business itself generates a hundred some thousand dollars in annual recurring revenue, and you can make fifty k a year from that business. Well, that is already interesting because that is all your money and you still own 100% of the business. Mm -hmm. You still have complete control over where the business is going. You still can hire other people or 
hire um, freelancers to do some work for you, bloggers or marketers or whatever, try to grow it. Or maybe more importantly, you could just sell it. And a business that does $100,000 in MRR, if you go to microacquire or you have a broker or something with, um, what is it, like uh, two to three, two to five, I don't know, uh, times yearly recurring revenue, that you're looking at half a million dollars hmm. in potential. Well, okay. How much you can sell this uh, 100K uh, a year business for? It depends on the industry. It depends on who's willing to buy it. It depends on many, many factors, right? Like how much earnings you might derive, how how good the uh, the PL looks, how, how the, the projections look, all of that stuff could be like a quarter of a million dollars, could be half a million dollars. Now, tell me if getting 100K a year and you have to work 40 hours a, uh, a day, a, a week for it, or if getting um, potentially somewhere between a quarter and half a million dollars in a one time payment for a business that you hand over. And then you can build other businesses or you can right. continue working in the business or on the business. Like, which is the more interesting opportunity? Yeah, I just I just also think, maybe again, because maybe it's a different perspective, right? Like, uh, and also the entrepreneurs that I speak with, most of us, we are not making more than 100 euros a month. Yeah, you know, yeah it's I, a, I, I know. I and know. Uh, and it's it, there's there's a lot of dark moments, and um, and I, I guess you also had uh, at yours, right? Oh yeah. W- what is what is the mindset there? Like uh, w- when you're looking, I, I'm now with the podcast making uh, 25 bucks a month, right, with mm-hmm. my members, but nice. I'm putting a lot of work, right? So. Yeah. This is far from paying the bills and I'm checking my runway. I will eventually have to get a job. So there's a lot of low moments. And I guess for a lot of entrepreneurs, they have their low moments. Do, do you also have low moments? Oh, man, I have low moments all the time. Because like obviously, we, we always compare each other uh, to other entrepreneurs yeah. and, and uh, the kind of stuff they put out there. But you see Peter Levels building Nomad List and Remote OK, and you think, wow, it's just one PHP file, and he's making millions. And you have all, all these interesting founders that share their progress. They Also, the best ones share their failures and their experiments, too. Mm-hmm. But you, you see a lot of people making a lot more money. I, it's the same for me. Like I'm a writer. I'm selling my books, and I... I sold, um, I must must be over 10,000 books at this point, which is amazing. That's but great. then I see people like um, James Clear, you know, Atomic Habits and selling millions of books. And I think, oh man, I, I wish I could do this and all that stuff. And I wish my, my books could like, make me a millionaire. But the thing is, why does it have to, right? Like if it is good enough to to put some additional money into my account every 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 month or every week then that's the goal the goal is not to uh, to just uh become the, the richest author in the world the goal is to get to a point where the business efforts are sustainable mm-hmm. and it's the same like what you say 25 bucks um is a good start it has to be more to be sustainable and that's what i would work towards it's i, I do this with my podcast too i have sponsors on my podcast right i mm-hmm. i'm at episode 110 i think this week and yeah. um it took a long time to get sponsors on the podcast the first ones paid me like 50 bucks so uh, I could barely pay my ConvertKit uh, newsletter of, of fees with, with my my <laughs> sponsors or my my transistor monthly fees with that. But now that I I have a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand listeners and uh, a reliable stream of of uh, sponsors, I can charge more, and I can charge a hundred bucks, hundred and fifty bucks per episode, and that's five hundred bucks a month, right? And I started my podcast two years ago. It took me over a year and a half to get sponsors. But now that I have them, other sponsors mm-hmm. are interested. It's a long play. Everything you do when you're building a business, when you're building a bootstrap business, when you're building a media bootstrap business is a long-term play. Mm-hmm. You have to trust that if you are consistent and you put in the effort and you allow people to invest in your journey, invest in you as a person, invest in your expertise, in your learning, in your teaching, that over time, provided that you take the chance on it, you will have opportunities to monetize what you're doing. That's really, yeah. that's the trust you need to have. Yeah, and that's really important. You do yeah. need, need to go to, needs to go towards that. So people might expect to have an overnight success, but it's really rare, right? So you people have to think that, okay, it will take 
maybe years, you know, one, two years to reach to a level of uh, of maybe sustainability in a business, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely. And and it might, it might not even happen. Like uh, before we had Feedback Panda, Daniela and I founded Feedback Panda. I mm-hmm. was part of a lot of um, software businesses that I co-founded with friends and colleagues from all different kinds of uh, previous relationships that I had with them professionally. And most of them never went anywhere. We spent months building a product. We we had marketing going on. We spent our own money and it, it just didn't go anywhere. These were expensive lessons. Like mm-hmm. I was trying to build a local food marketplace in Berlin with my friends, like a digital website, like a marketplace for them. And that didn't find the resonance that we had hoped. Now, yeah. fast forward to 2017, where then Danielle and I uh, founded Feedback Panda. We put a lot of our own money into it and we, we had it as a side project for nine months. In nine months, I was a software engineer, full-time engineer. Um, she was an online teacher, full-time teacher, and we had it moonlighting on the side for nine months until it made about, yeah, it must have been 15,000, 10, 15,000 uh, euros in monthly recurring revenue because we, we put everything into the business to make it as automated as possible, to be as low touch as possible. We had Stripe integration. We had customer service automation systems in there. Built that from the start because we knew this needs to stand on its own feet for mm-hmm. us to spend our full-time energy on it. And until it does, we are going to do our full-time jobs. Right. So yeah. the, the way to getting to this point is to build a side project and have it be as yeah as self-sustaining as possible. As possible. That, at least that's, that's what I see as, as the most effective mm-hmm. way of de-risking yeah. your, your business. And keep on trying new things, right? Yeah, uh, keep exactly. Keep on uh, experimenting and uh, eventually, with a lot of work, you will uh, you'll reach a certain degree of success. And uh, does does building in public help with that? Help with the uh, with the motivation to to keep yeah. to keep your head in the game. I think motivation is already an important word here. I think that there's motivation and accountability. Both of them need to be there for for a person building a business because um, I think we all like to be in our comfort zones. We all want to do the things that we know how to do them and we don't want to fail. We don't want to show that we're weak. We don't want to show that we're vulnerable. And building in public allows us to experiment and fail and learn and through that build meaningful relationships with people. Um, personally, as a, as a human being, uh, when I am on Twitter and when I follow somebody, I don't follow them because they're super successful. I follow them because they're honest and because they're sharing when they fail. That's where mm-hmm. I go, right? That's when I, I really invest in a relationship on Twitter is when I see people being truthful and being vulnerable and being themselves. That's where I put, that, that's where I put my vote by the, by following them. And those people build in public. Those people share their emotional state. They share their goals. They share their dreams. They share their nightmares. They share what works, what doesn't work. And that is what's interesting. And that is what helps you build honest relationships with your potential customers, with other founders, with people who are interested in you. And it also builds this kind of feedback loop that quickly allows you to figure out if the things that are you doing that you're doing are the things that you should be doing, mm-hmm. right? Like if you um, communicate while you're doing the things that you're doing and you share it with people in public, you are much, much faster at uh, understanding why it will or will not work, what people's right. reservations are, what you should do differently than if you were to do this for months and months in isolation. And then you talk to people and then you figure out, oh, they don't want this at all. Or I completely misunderstood something. Wow, I wish I would have known that five months ago before I started building this. But what is the difference between... Because you can build in public or, or at least get that feedback from your users without sharing publicly on Twitter, right? So you, you could just have a mailing list. You yeah. could just DM them and ask questions about their products. And I guess a lot of people do this. But this new movement, I call it new because I kind of discovered it recently. Maybe it's not that yeah. new. Of, yeah. of building in public and uh, for people that know, don't know, for instance, on Twitter, I don't know, there's already a lot of other platforms around mm-hmm. it. But on Twitter, especially if you use the hashtag build in public, you'll see a lot of developers, a lot of p- marketeers, people building products and basically sharing their day to day, their goals, everything there. And for me, it's the most interesting hashtag that there is on Twitter. There's no yeah. spam. There's nothing like this. It's, it's really, really interesting. W- when did this movement started and what is the difference between sharing on Twitter and using this hashtag or whatever 
and yeah. messaging people directly. So uh, the, the movement itself is actually not that young. It's just uh, the social media part of it that is quite new. It mm -hmm. started in like 2007, 2008, when Pat Flynn of the um, Passive Income uh, podcast, um, when he started sharing his passive income strategies on the web and uh, th through blogs and kind of stuff. Like that mm -hmm. kind of is, is the first real big occurrence of that. And uh, you've seen it on Reddit in the meantime. There was the Entrepreneur Ride Along subreddit right. where people just shared what they were doing. And um, yeah, the, the forums, people were sharing their progress uh, updates, uh, building updates on forums. It just didn't have the name built in public back then. Just like the no-code movement has been around forever, right? There's what you yeah. see is what you get. That was back in 2000, like with Microsoft Front Page and, and, and Adobe Dreamweaver. There was the first no-code tool in the market. It wasn't called no-code then, yeah. and it's now more web-based thing but no code has been around it just had a different name and building in public has been around it just had yeah an entrepreneur sharing the journey kind of a name as well and it kind of started i think it must have been 20s 15 16 17 when people like peter levels were doing their building uh, 10 or 100 businesses in public sharing their every step along the way you had it with um the, the founder of product hunt he shared his journey uh, Ryan Hoover, like his journey along along the way, and Product Hunt came out of that, and you had a, just people sharing their their SaaS founder journey along the way there as well. And now it's this big thing on Twitter where people are building community around building in public, where right. founders help each other build in public and um, yeah support each other as a kind of support network. So that's mm -hmm. where it's coming from. And that's why it's so efficient. Because if you build in public today, you're not only doing this to get customers, right? You're not doing this as a marketing play. It's not a marketing strategy. It's a full-on approach to building a business. You find other founders who are either ahead on their journey, like they're further along than you are, and they can teach you what they learned. Or you find other founders who are behind you on their journey, and you can teach them what you learned, and you get feedback on that when they start implementing it in their own businesses. So there's a founder side to that. And then there's the customer, the prospect side, the audience side, where you are involved with your community, not of founders, but of people who you're building your product for, and you get to have conversations with them on an ongoing basis, right? If you are if you're a software engineer building for other software engineers, you get to talk to software engineers on Twitter, but you mm -hmm. also get to talk to founders on Twitter. And if you're building for somebody who is not on Twitter, you're building public on another community, like on LinkedIn or on Facebook, and you get your feedback loops there. The tightness of the feedback loop, no matter if it's the entrepreneurial side or the professional side, the actual business that you're building, is incredibly useful. Like I said, you get information much faster. And maybe right. to, to illustrate that even more, you're building two brands at the same time. When you are on Twitter and you're sharing what you're doing in your business in public, you build a professional brand for the business, yeah, obviously, the personal one. Mm -hmm. and you build a personal brand among the founders. Mm -hmm. There is one thing about this personal brand, no matter if you mess up your business or not, right? Your business could fail, your business could fizzle out, or it could be super successful. Doesn't matter. The founder brand that you built by being a human being that shares the ups and downs, the learnings, and the, the stuff that they can teach on Twitter you build an immutable brand. True, no matter true, what happens true. to your business, your you founder brand. Community. Yeah, you yeah. keep the people. You keep your distribution channel. Yes, and it's only going to grow over time because the more mm. you build, the more new people you attract, attract in public or the more mm. people that other people help come to your brand, the, the stronger your brand will be over time. That's why building right. in public is so strong because even if you fail, you will have this group of people that are invested in your next journey, right? The next time you build something, they're going to be there for you. Right. Is it, is it important to then use your personal brand, your personal Twitter account to, <laughs> to build your brand? Is that a personal question? <laughs> am, I, am I hearing that? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. I think um, it's uh, it's something that that often works better than having a brand that is only like the professional business that you're building uh, or doing both is also fine. But I think as a person, as a founder out there, um, your personal brand is quite valuable. Like look mm -hmm. at people like uh, Ryan Hoover or look at people like Peter Levels. Right? right, they are the brand. It's not uh, that Nomad List is the the best business ever built, but it's 
the business that Peter Levels built. Right. And if it's it's not the product hunt is is unique in the way that it lists things that people can upvote or downvote. Reddit works the same way in many ways, but it's it's like Ryan's brand, and it's um the he worked and he is so active in the community that people supported him and you know supported the products that he was building and made product hunt the success that it was. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend at least having yourself be attached to the brand very prominently. Right. Um, in, in your case as well, right? Like I'm just mm. uh, turning this into some personal consulting here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I love what you're doing with um, your project right now. With, um, it's a, the entrepreneur, but mm -hmm. I think your, your personal brand should be stronger in that because it's you stronger, yeah. are who I want to see more and learn more about. Yeah. I love yeah. your other project, but I want to know more about you. Like the wannabe entrepreneur is awesome. Now, who is it? <laughs> you exactly. know yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. people want to know because we want yeah. to have personal meaningful relationships with other people makes sense makes total sense and i i've been trying to do that by having my my picture as well yeah uh I, yeah, by, you're in there. by introducing myself and uh, in, initially what i thought was people because i'm i'm tweeting as the wannabe entrepreneur and people be like what is the wannabe entrepreneur right so yeah. that's that's what i thought and if it's if i'm tweeting as tiago people will be like okay it's, this is another guy they don't know what they might not know that I have a product. So that was the idea initially. But yeah. I, the more I, I go through Twitter, I'm, I understand that it's important to connect yourself, you know, a, a person yeah. to, to the brand. And uh, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely a great... Uh, if I were to consult you on this, and sorry for just like pushing this kind of consulting stuff on you now, but I'm just no, looking at your profile. I think you're already doing, doing something really great with like having your face on it, like because that is what people resonate with. Like mm -hmm. it's a human voice. It's a human face. And it's the human name that people built mental models around, right? It's, right. it's like uh, you want to look at something, you want to hear something, and you want to know what to call it. That's kind of how we interact with people. And you already, the wannabe entrepreneur is a wonderful name. I really, really love this because it's... Oh, you're first it, person it that likes it. <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> well, say, why do you call yourself a wannabe? <laughs> because you, you talk to other people who are wannabes, right? You yeah. are you are clearly aiming at other people and you, you want them to resonate with, oh yeah, I'm also a wannabe entrepreneur. What I would do in this case is just add your first name right to this. Tiago, the wannabe Similar entrepreneur. Idea. That's mm -hmm. what. That's all you need to do to personalize it. Because now, ah, okay, this is the name. I see the face. Oh, I yeah. hear it on the podcast, and now I know what to call him. And now, whenever I, whenever people talk about you in public somewhere, they say Tiago. You know, Tiago, they want to be entrepreneur. That's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's that's really all I would do at this point. But that's, yeah, that's, course, thank you so much for the free consultancy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really really great idea, and uh, thank you so much for uh, for all the knowledge that you shared in this this conversation i have uh, two last quick questions for <laughs> sure. you to, to to finish uh the first one is what is the the thing about entrepreneurship bootstrapping that makes you the most joy you know the is it getting a comment from a person or from mm -hmm. a user is it getting money in the bank what is the thing that really you know makes you you know cry tears of joy uh in this whole process Every time I see another founder like sharing some kind of success as a consequence of what they what they learned, either from me or from the people that talk about the things that I talk about, and you know, like whenever I see a founder enjoy mm -hmm. success, some kind of success, even if it's the smallest bit, like oh, I got my first customer today, or I right. got my tenth customer today, or I got my hundred and seventh customer today, that just makes me happy. Like seeing somebody empowering themselves either through my work or other work of, by people in the community, it it's just makes me smile. Because mm -hmm. anything that gets people to closer to the, the moment of financial stability, them, themselves owning the means of production for their life, owning the sources of income, anything I see, Anything, any kind of empowerment I see in the community just makes me happy. We can feel that when we when uh, we <laughs> chat with you and with everything you do, I think it's it's really important and it's really nice. And uh, thank you so much. One, one last question here from uh, from sure. Bogdan. He, he wrote here on, on Twitter, yeah. and I think it's a great question to to finish our interview with. Is um, which was the biggest failure, I guess, in your career, and how does uh, do you see this failure now versus how you, you saw this failure then? 
So yeah, professionally, I think the example with, uh, um, I hinted at it, the, the local food marketplace mm -hmm. um, here in Berlin. So I co-founded this uh, business with two friends of mine, one of which was a designer. And the other one um, was like, very entrepreneurial. He came from a, a family that had a little walnut tree farm. And like, he knew exactly what like the, the local food situation was. He was himself a foodie. And we all kind of were interested in that because Berlin is a city full of hipsters that want good food. And Berlin is surrounded by a lot of really interesting local food producers, like high quality, locally, regionally produced um, food. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to connect the two. And what we did was we assumed that all the foodies in Berlin needed a marketplace and all the suppliers outside of Berlin needed a marketplace, a web-based marketplace to sell their food through. And we never asked them. We never asked anybody out there, well, if you wanted to buy local food, would you, would you go to a website? What would you do? And we never asked the people on the other side of the marketplace, the farmers, if you want to sell your food to more um, people in the city, would a web-based application be something that you would even be remotely interested in? Or would you go to your computer or how would you approach it? We never did the research. We just thought, hey, we, we know how to build a website. We have a designer to make it look cool. Mm -hmm. And then we spent literally six months in an office that we rented um, on computers that we bought on uh, hiring people, we had some funding from the European Union, kind of kind of VC like funding um, right. for a smart city project. We just spent time in that office building a platform that nobody needed, that nobody said is something that they would use. Then we launched it, and nothing happened. That is mm. the biggest failure of my software engineering and entrepreneurial career. And what we learned was that if you don't talk to people. All your assumptions are just assumptions. If you don't validate right. with people out there, you are going to build something that nobody needs. You're going to waste your time. You're going to waste your money. Yeah. And um, that was an expensive, expensive learning. But it's I can it's an honest mistake because when you pitch this idea, I think, wow, that's a great idea. <laughs> I yeah. want to use it. I, like, I want to use it too. Hank, yeah. That's the thing. But we just built it in a way that people um, didn't resonate with. Like mm -hmm. they didn't want to have a marketplace. Um, where they had to scroll through each potential vendor and select yeah. the items that may or may not be available today. Because, you know, like if you're a bakery, sometimes you have the bread, sometimes it's out of stock. Like, they, yeah. and, and the, the bakery didn't want to keep updating their profile on our website all the time. Like, right. we just didn't, didn't figure out the logistics of it. The yeah. idea was but nice. the problem exists, right? The problem, yeah, the I guess, problem still exists. Is there. It's just not the same solution. Yeah. Maybe the next project are of it. Yeah, maybe. Do but it honestly, the right I, way now. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this point, I would definitely do it in a different way. Yeah. I would immediately go to go to uh, food markets, like local food market, actual markets, and talk to the vendors about their experiences with the the digital world. Like, have you ever done anything on the internet, or why haven't you? And then I would try mm -hmm. to figure out what is in the way of them getting into like a more digital way, right? A digital way of doing marketing, digital right, way right. of getting people to buy their stuff. I would just approach it very differently. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if I hadn't done this, if I hadn't failed so horribly, I would never have the experience that I had when I started Feedback Panda. Right? I would never right. have thought, okay, we yeah. need to talk to these teachers before we build anything. And Danielle and I, we, we chatted with a lot of teachers. We built a prototype that... Danielle tested extensively before we ever um, considered like, putting it on the market. We got right. beta users quite quite early, so we could test it with them. And like all the learnings that we had from our failed uh, things before in life really, really helped us build this much better. Mm -hmm. And listening to a lot of podcasts and reading lots of books that really yes. helped too. But, yeah, and you yeah. learn more from your mistakes than from uh, your successes, for yeah, sure. Well. Yeah, because mm -hmm. success just happens, and maybe you were lucky, maybe it was intentional, exactly, yeah. but you learn a lot from from failure too. It's both. Yeah. You need both, right? It's it's not you, you can both, just yeah. learn exclusively mm -hmm. from mistakes, but you you need to yeah you need to be able to own them and to accept that you failed. You had a wrongful assumption, and now you need to have a different assumption and test that. You need to experiment. Mm -hmm. Arvid, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it was really lovely to chat with you. I think we could chat for hours. But yeah. I think there's already a lot of information here, a lot of interesting uh, facts and tips for all my listeners, all my wannabe entrepreneurs. So thank you very much. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. That was a really nice conversation. And we did cover quite a lot of things. Yes, so. yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I really enjoyed awesome. it. And uh, I will link uh, all of your books in, uh, in the description, in the show notes of the episode. Thank you. And uh, I also something that we didn't end up speaking too much about, which is our most recent project, Building Public Book. But I think it's very, a very interesting, cool project that uh, people can actually sign up and help you build your book, right? Yeah, I'm trying to write it in public because what's better um, about a building public project than building the building public project itself in public? So yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to be very meta with this one and have people involved from the start. So yeah, if, if they go to buildingpublicbook.com, they can sign up to be like an alpha reader the moment I have the first draft together. And I'm I'm kind of writing it article by article every week anyway. So if you if you go to my blog, the, the bootstrap founder um, dot com, you will see every week there's a new article that may or may not be a chapter in the book anyway. So I'm building mm -hmm. all of this as I go. So if people are interested, just follow my journey and I'll I'll just talk about this nonstop anyway. So definitely. I, will, I will definitely follow uh, for sure. And now for the listeners, this was another interview. I hope you had fun and learned a lot. I know that I definitely did. And there are a lot of other interviews with other entrepreneurs, marketeers, designers. So make sure to check them out. You can just go to the website and click on episodes. And then you can even filter by interviews and listen to the ones that most interest you. If you want to support this podcast, I don't do any advertisement. So you can become a member or just buy me a coffee. If you do become a member, you can gain access to our virtual co-working space for bootstrappers, a place that is filled with other entrepreneurs from multiple backgrounds. And uh, you can find mentorship and support. I love to be in that community and I'm excited to see you there. And you pay a monthly subscription of four euros per month the link will also be in the description of this episode besides that make sure to share this episode with all of your entrepreneur friends i'm sure they will also appreciate it and give a nice review on apple podcasts because that really helps to bump the visibility of my show this was another wannabe entrepreneur see you next tuesday